Hello and welcome to the Forums podcast streaming live on Sunday the 5th of July and joining me on this edition is Steve Withers. Do I give you the ass or the crotch? Ed Sally. It's only after we've lost everything that we're free to do anything. And Kaz Harlow. Run, Forrest, run. Uh, remember, we're streaming once again. That's a good one, Kaz. That'll confuse people. Uh, we <laughs> are streaming again once again. So thank you for joining us this evening if you're joining us live. If you're not joining us live, you can ov- obviously catch up with us at any time on YouTube. And also the audio version of the podcast is available through providers such as iTunes and Spotify. Uh, just search the Forums podcast. You'll be able to find us if you want to listen to us audio only, if you're going out jogging or taking the dog for a walk or whatever. Probably better just to listen than to watch. Uh, we'll also have our Q&A tonight. Uh, hardware, hi-fi and movie questions get them coming in this evening Um, we will uh, try and answer them as quickly as we can but we are going to limit uh, question time to 10 minutes um, because we're running too long on these things so so yes, I guess the best uh, way to get your your question answered would be to make a donation Um, you can do that two ways, so we launched our Patreon campaign, we've got two new patrons uh, this week, Angus and Gavin Wilkes, welcome along to the podcast. Thank you for being patrons. If you want to become a patron, go to patreon.com forward slash AV forums and you can sign up for £3 per month if you do that. Or if you just want to make a one-off donation and ask us a question on the back of that, uh, then it's streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums. Um, and like I say, that's probably the perfect way for you to get your questions answered. Like I say, um, I'm going to keep it at a, at a swift 10 minutes this week. Um, also, remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Um, uh, if you enjoy these live podcasts, if you want to try and get us to improve them in any way, then uh, you know, give us <laughs> give us your advice in the uh, in the questions and the comments. Sorry, and um, and yeah, hit the like button. That's the most important thing. If you do like the AV Forums podcast, hitting the like button is the most important thing you can do. Uh, second to that is to subscribe. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, then do that as well. And then if you want uh, complete overdose of av forums you also hit the notification bell as steve keeps saying every week and that will notify you every time we publish a new video um and never miss anything (laughs) <laughs> no, you'll never miss a thing. Um, and we've got lots of those coming up. We've got lots of videos actually in the pipeline being made at the moment. So you should see a, a, a big rush of videos in the next few weeks. Um, also, like I say, if you uh, appreciate everything, then I've given you the two links um, for donating there. And by doing that, by supporting us, you also contribute to growing AV forums. You make us uh, very proud that you're following us and supporting us. And we can also speed up the site, add new features, um, even try and do good put podcasts and videos and that kind of thing so um yeah thank you very much for your support as always we're going to do competitions we're going to do a bit different this week because why not um so kaz go through well, we can go and do it in french or something <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking about that it's probably a bit too much but we're going to split it up because the podcast only um competition is going to be right at the end so you're going to have to watch the whole thing um to get to the the podcast competition but cars current competitions are yep we, you can win a copy of criterion's july titles that's female trouble the cameraman and three outlaw samurai on blu-ray that closes 4th of august copy of the invisible man on 4k that closes 28th of july Crisscross on Blu-ray closes 21st of July. The Last Waltz on Blu-ray closes 14th of July. Greed on Blu-ray also closes 14th of July. Flax Season 2 on DVD, that closes 30th of June. Sonic the Hedgehog on Blu-ray, 7th of July. A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood on Blu-ray, 7th of July. And Criterion's June titles, that competition's still open. Husbands, Dance Girl Dance and Scorsese Shorts, all on Blu-ray, that closes 7th of July. Uh, You can also win a copy of Laughter in Paradise on Blu-ray, which closes 21st of July. And the podcast competition, as Phil said, is at the end, so stay tuned for that. All competitions are open to eligible AV Forums members resident in the UK. Any previous winners, Kaz? Yeah, we've got a couple of winners. Mikey Cubed won Snowpiercer on Blu-ray and Coz. Coz 22998, if nobody knows who Coz is, but everyone should. Uh, won my May's Criterion titles on Blu-ray and actually published a picture of them when he received them. So yeah. I think he was quite... Well, true. Mikey Q to put a nice message up on Twitter as well. Oh, did he? So, yes, oh, he did. Really... So, yeah, thank you for, you know, responding and showing yeah. that you're not just prize-winning bots. 
<laughs> if such a thing exists, I don't know. But no, it was, it's always nice to see a bit of interaction. So, yeah, that was all good. It is, I, especially with you having a pub behind you, Ed. Have you been to the pub yet? No, no, someone was asking in the oh. comments. No, I, I, it opened yesterday, obviously, in the UK. Well, not in the UK, in England. Um, I had my son for the better part of yesterday. And I, I thought, you know what, let's just let's get other people to do some some test runs first we'll see how it goes um it looks to be in my part of the world actually it looks to have gone very very well so um i'm actually down at my parents next weekend but i am sure that there will be a pub visit before too long in a responsible socially distanced sort of way so yeah i didn't go to the pub and the pub behind me just in case, it, just to, for the avoidance of all doubt is neither my local nor still exists um, it looks well rough if anyone um is uh, watching this from Bolton, they may or may not recognise the. So, Ed, um, did you ever go to this pub in Bolton? No, 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 I didn't. But I, no. I, I, someone, someone I know uh, did manage to go. Although that was before it started its really terminal decline. Um, but yes, it, it had a, a, a fairly legendary reputation for being pretty grim. So right. um, I thought it was too good not to have as a. So is, is it one of these urban myths that you tell all your mates that you've been to like the Hacienda was in Manchester? It's amazing how many people went to the Hacienda. Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, yeah, it's like the third man on the balcony for the uh, <laughs> the Iranian embassy siege, isn't it? No, I I I've been to some terrible pubs in my time, but I mean Bolton I was so. a bit a bit far for a night out from me, so I just <laughs> let let it be. So yeah. Uh, well, I mean, talking about bars and locals and all the rest, it's nice to see that the uh, the locals have turned up uh, for the podcast. So, uh, very good evening to Gary Hall, Nigel, Phil Singh, um, licensed taxi man, Paul, Simon from Greece, uh, Ken's here as well from Edinburgh. Uh, we've also got Nigel and Adrian as well. So, welcome along. Thank you very much for uh, your comments so far in the comments window. Uh, nice to see you all here. Nice to see a big number there of people watching. So, we'll try and hang on to you lot. We'll try and be good. Um, <laughs> Something a bit more interesting then. <laughs> uh, right, so talking about interesting, Kaz, what have you been doing? What have I been doing this month? Well, uh, month. I've been... Just the week, mate, just the week. Just the week, that's true. <laughs> Feels like a whole new month after the best of last Well, month. it is a new it month. It is, technically, but you, you, we're still only on the 5th of it, mate, so... Yes, haven't haven't really got very far. Stayed clear of the uh, pubs, but had a socially distant barbecue for um in the that must make weekend. turning the stuff over really difficult yes <laughs> yeah no help on the barbecue um which was really nice and nice for the kids uh and as as usual watching far too much stuff and struggling to find anything on 4k although i was pleasantly surprised because i came across crying freeman in 4k uh, you're talking this... about disc cars yeah right yeah. yeah, the 4K disc, struggling to find any new 4K releases. I mean, obviously, because there aren't any new films. Uh, but I did think they'd pull out a few more back catalogue titles by now. I know there's been loads of announcements, and clearly no one anticipated this crisis. So perhaps part of the problem is it takes yeah, a little bit of work. It all depends to... on what they've got lined up, really. Yes. Because, I mean, a yeah. lot of these releases, even the back catalogue stuff, you're talking six months at least. Yes, yes, absolutely. I, Can I just say, The Abyss, yeah. give us The Abyss, just get on with it. Oh, oh, yeah. It's, it's never going to happen. That's, yeah. that's True lies. 10 years in the making. Um, <laughs> but but uh, I know it's ready to go, so just give us it. Yeah. This is your Carthago de Lenda Est, isn't it, Steve? You're going to step in. Hill I'm gonna every, get... Yeah, every it's speech. It's the hill I'm going to die on. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah. but I was I was I've been looking at a few uh, foreign releases because the US have got quite a few titles we don't, and uh, and I, I came across this release from Germany. Um, I didn't realise Crying Freeman. For those who don't know, it's uh, one of it's the directorial debut of Christoph Gans, who gave us Brotherhood of the Wolf. Um, it stars Mark Dacascos. That would be who, a good release. Brotherhood of the Wolf would be yeah. an amazing release, but. Let's not even get into that. They've already got too many cuts to play with, and they've never really released the, I'm going to call it the French cut in uh, in the UK anyway. So so who knows what treatment we'd get for that? But um, Christoph Gans, he's he's a very uh, he's a very good director, even though he hasn't really directed a great deal of stuff. And Mark Dacascos is really underrated action star. He was recently in uh, John Wick Parabellum as the main antagonist. And um, his speciality is capoeira, so he's got a very fluid martial arts style. Um, Crying Freeman's based on the manga and uh, is a 1995 flick, um, and it feels like a French John Woo, somewhere between John Woo and Luc Besson. 
Uh, obviously shot on a budget as a de- debut. But I've got to uh, say, Kaz, you're not really selling this to me. Go on. I actually <laughs> love it. It's not your kind of thing, Phil. I don't think. I don't think you're gonna. It, it's almost one of those films which, if you We're watched not cool it, enough for it, Phil. Sorry. In in the nineties, yep. you probably loved it. But um, but if you come across it now, you, you might find it a little bit. Low rent. No, I, um, I really enjoyed but, Brotherhood of the Wolf, so I don't know. Maybe uh... yeah, maybe, but Brotherhood of the Wolf has got the edge of being this fantastic blend of different genres. Like you can't you can't pin any one genre on it because it it sticks martial arts into French legend, into some kind of horror, uh, murder mystery. Um, I mean, it's got a bit of everything, and unfortunately, romance too. But then again, it's got Monica Bellucci. So unfortunately. Really uh, because I think that the romance in it is one of the things that really hampered it. Not with Monica Bellucci, but with the main love interest. I don't know why we're going off on the sidetrack, but I happen to think that it, it damages the the rest of the story in that because it was a really badly written and even even more badly edited uh, part of the movie. So in the in the UK Cup, we never got to see the reasons why their romance kept uh, falling apart and getting back together, and it just made it unintelligible. It should have stripped it straight out. Other than that, Vincent Cassell, Mark Dacoskis, I mean, Monica Bellucci. But I'm selling Brotherhood of the Wolf now. I mean, honestly, Phil, if you love Brotherhood of the Wolf, you could try Crying Freeman. And for those who are unsure about actually importing a very well-priced German 4K release, which does look pretty good considering where the films come from, um, you could check it out for free on Amazon Prime, I believe, at the moment. Okay. So, so, so that's, that's what that you've been doing all week, is it? Uh, I, I was very much looking again. forward to that and trying my best to watch it pretty much as soon as the kids go down when I have a bit of time to to dip into something which I blatantly I'm going to be the only person in the house watching it. So I had to watch it in like four installments over the week. on this podcast is going to be watching it. It's a great, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a great guilty pleasure action movie. Good, good. So we'll we'll come on to more stuff because, like you say, we're at the start of the month, so there's some uh, interesting things coming along streaming wise and so on. Um, even though there's no new films coming out yes. at the moment, and obviously cinemas are, are going to be start opening this month as well. So we'll come on and discuss that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ed, um, apart from not going to the pub, and and Ken was right, that took a lot of restraint there. Well, um, you know, self restraint. So. I, I, it's a, it's a, it's a long game. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that before too long, I'll be appearing on a Sunday evening podcast, still tremendously hungover from the night before, but we'll see how we go. <laughs> right. Well, the thing is, it's interested me in, in the running order. You said you bought a new phone. Now I can probably guarantee that's not an Apple. No, absolutely. And to be clear, this is no, I have no uh, ax to grind with Apple. Uh, I have an iPad pro. I love it. I like iPhones. But uh, in terms of testing, I find it's worth having an example of both an iOS and an Android interface. So I've had Android phones going back now to the original Nexus 5. Um, I actually reviewed the last long-term phone I had for AV forums because it was MQA compatible. So I had an essential uh, PH1, but my son dropped it and the screen fell out which is usually its way of saying that's probably all it had to give. Um, so I used a backup for a bit, and I have replaced it with an Oppo Find X2 Neo, uh, which is a particularly snappy and pointless name. But, Never um, heard of it. No, well, I mean, as this is, you know, Oppo of Blu-ray player fame. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's great. It does all the things that I would realistically expect a phone to do. What amuses me is that, I mean... The arms race for phone technology is just ridiculous now. It's 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of of, uh, memory, uh, which is uh, the same as this laptop that I'm doing this on. (laughs) That was was impressive, Stuart. That's how quickly you got that up there. So, um, yeah, it's... And as Adrian Califf just pointed out, Oppo and OnePlus are two cheeks of the same arse, so to speak. Um, So, essentially... It's very similar to a OnePlus 8, but uh, with the OnePlus 8, you get certain widgets which were not of interest to me. Um, And this, you just get more memory and a slightly less uh, versatile sort of video and camera suite. But I don't do anything too dramatic there. I bought it SIM free. I will be doing the same thing as you, Mr. Hinton. I will be going off to the good people at three for a SIM only deal for all the data I can possibly get my head round um and uh, yeah it's already it's it's got a nice clean up-to-date example of android 
as the operating system. So yeah, it allows me, when I review a product uh, which has uh, control apps, where there are two apps, it just means that I can tell you how they both are rather than um, you know just yeah. going, oh, the iOS app's great and the rest of it and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, I have been doing some some sort of finishing off work for a couple of other people this uh, this last couple of days. Uh, I've been lining up some more product for you guys. I'd like the record to state, and Phil will confirm this, that everything for June was uploaded and completed on the 30th of June. It so, was. You know, there's that. More than I can say. <laughs> well, there you go. So, you know, um, uh, and I've even got two of my July products in and running at the moment as well. So enjoy this rare moment of order and cohesion <laughs> whilst it lasts. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pick up on something Adrian's mentioned. Question, will you be reviewing the Denon AVC X6700? Uh, um, stay tuned for this one because we should have something come up on the 21st of this month, which is a Tuesday night, around about 7 p.m. We may have uh, another podcast, a special podcast, where Denon are going to come along and actually talk about the new product lineup and talk about things like HDMI 2.1 and all sorts of other things that are interesting, including DTSX Pro. So stay tuned for that. There's a, a very good question, that one, Adrian. Um, yes, we will be looking at them, but Denon are coming on to the podcast. We're going to do a special podcast Tuesday, the 21st of this month, um, 7 p.m. start time. And um, we'll have uh, a number of uh, Denon reps on the call to talk about all sorts of things. So it's not just going to be talking about um, the new products. We're actually going to talk about a lot of the technology, and it'll be a bit of a technical talk. So uh, yeah. well worth coming along for that one. So thanks for asking that, Adrian. Um, right, so what else has been going on? Steve, what have you been up to? Well, um, the good news about us coming out of lockdown has not been the opening of pubs uh, or people going back Just to work. Speak for yourself. <laughs> it's the fact that uh, they're finally sort of, you know, relaxing the throttling on the, on the broadband and on the streaming services. So uh, I actually was aware of this when we were doing last week's podcast, but uh, it didn't seem to be working on everything. So I didn't mention it. But uh, Disney have now put Atmos, despite the fact it was showing, you know, Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, when you went into the app, um, you couldn't actually get any Atmos soundtrack. So uh, they added that this week, um, and I took the opportunity yesterday of rewatching the whole of the Mandalorian in Dolby Atmos, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, so that was what I Daisy did. Um, and then, in terms of recent products, uh, this one is in the CMS, so I'm sure Phil will have it up fairly soon. But uh, I've just recently had the Samsung HW Q800T in for review. I think I'm the first person to get my hands on one, uh, and um, yeah, really good. That's, that's a soundbar, yeah. Yes, that's about to say. That's a soundbar. HW is the. I know it's a bit confusing because it's like Q800T is also yeah, a TV. It's also a TV, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I always have to make sure I do the HW bit beforehand. You can't really shorten it to Q800T in the review because then it just starts confusing. The, they, they haven't been thinking about this, not only for uh, sites like ourselves who write these reviews and, and rely on SEO to get people to come <laughs> and look at the products, but also their own website. You know, people will just put in Samsung Q800 and yeah. they'll get a load of TVs back rather than the sound bar they're looking for. So they need to think about the, uh, the naming conventions, I think. Well, I think their logic is it, it ties it in, you know, you get the TV and the soundbar to go with it. But, I mean, you use this soundbar with many different Samsung TVs, not necessarily just the Q800. So I don't think that necessarily works, that logic. But they've been doing it for a few years now, so I don't think they're going to change anytime soon. Anyway, it's basically the replacement for last year's Q70. And uh, it's, it's a good soundbar. It's a good all-round soundbar. Basically, you get you get, um, let's see, you get 3.1.2 in terms of um, Atmos and DTSX. Uh, so you've got two other firing drivers, three, four firing drivers in a sub. You can, if you want, buy the optional uh, rear, rear speaker package if you want wireless rears. So you can do 5.1.2. Um, yeah, as with any soundbar where there's, if you just talk about the basic package, where there's no rear speakers, obviously the sense of immersion is limited. It's very much the effect at the front of the room, the first third of the room. This is what I was talking about, I think, last week when I was talking about the uh, LG SN7. You know, that's just the nature of... Um, of soundbars really you know if you, if you don't have rear speakers you can't really expect to have surround effects um so by that vir by virtue of that you know the effects um, are very much in the first third of the room however uh it uses um what they call acoustic beaming um which is essentially 56 holes in the top of the soundbar which they've moved to the front of the soundbar now so that if you put it under a tv it's not going to block um the audio because obviously you want to make sure that you've got the upward fire drivers clear of any any any, any obstructions because you want to fire them up 
bouncing off the ceiling back down at you so you get the overhead effects and this sort of spreads it out over the uh, uh, sort of up and across to the side slightly so you get a more a more expansive overhead effect than you would normally plus obviously you've got the expansive front sound stage from the four three three four fine speakers you've got a dedicated center speaker for dialogue which is good you've got a fairly hefty sub that goes pretty deep so you've got some nice bass there uh, DTSX and Dolby Atmos, as I said, it will, it, and and this is pretty unusual for soundbars. It passes Dolby Vision and HDR10 plus. So if you're looking for, yeah, yeah. But then again, bizarrely, um, you know, you've got um, Panasonic who who make TVs and players that do both, and then and their soundbars don't pass both or either of them. I didn't think one of them didn't pass either. Um, you've got LG who are passing Vision but not HDR10 Plus because they absolutely refuse. I to. just think they're doing it. To, it it's now just a, an exercise in 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 bloody mindedness in the case um, of lg it absolutely is an exercise in bloody mindedness um in the case of pans i have no idea what they were thinking other than maybe that they just didn't want to pay i don't know why they wouldn't pass both given that their tvs and players did it uh, but samsung passes both so if you're looking for a soundbar that you know if you've got a panasonic tv and player and you want a soundbar that will actually pass both formats for you then uh, the samsung should jump your man and um, that applies to all their samples not just the uh, 800 but uh yeah, it's it's a good all round soundbar. It costs seven nine nine. I expect the price will drop pretty quickly. So you know, they always come out a bit toppy. I think on the price initially, then they usually drop fairly quickly after that. Um, you know, seven nine nine is isn't cheap. Uh, and if you think about it, you could go for the JBL um, nine point one, which is which is which is five point one point four proper immersion for uh, for nine nine for eight nine nine. So only a hundred quid more. So. Yeah, there are definitely alternatives to that price point. It's probably a little bit toppy on the price. Performance-wise, though, it is really good. It does everything you want it to do. You know, it's a good all-rounder for TV, for movies, for gaming, uh, for music even. It sounds pretty good music as well. Uh, it, it's a good all-round um, soundbar. So, yeah, I, I liked it. Okay, good stuff. Um, I still need to watch The Mandalorian. I, I might go and watch it now that Atmos is uh, available. It five hours well. to watch the whole this thing. This is going to be and, another yes. one of your Game of Thrones things, Phil. I look forward to it probably <laughs> happening. Yeah, Game of Thrones hasn't don't, happened Don't either. bother with yeah. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Just I mean, we've, had, we've had the whole lockdown and I've got <laughs> near any of the stuff I said I was going to do. To be honest, I, mean, I, I, I envisaged that I would get around to watching certain things that I'd never got around to watching. But it, we fall back there's an element of falling back to things that we find comforting and pre-apocalyptic. And then again, in the specific case of, well, you've got outside interests, you know, involving, you know, cars and stuff. And I've been doing a lot with music and things like that. It just, it, it doesn't follow that you just sit and turn the television on. No, I mean, that's, I, I, that's what you wanted to do anyway. I mean, you get this, don't you? And you get people saying, oh, well, you know, if you don't use lockdown to come out with a new skill and all the rest of it. Well, sorry, I I, I didn't change during lockdown. I was still working, as was Steve, as was Ed. Um, I don't think Kaz was as well, I think. So, um, <laughs> joking, Kaz. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, they, these people say, oh, well, you should have, you know, learnt French or German while you were in lockdown and all the rest of it and watch this, watch that. Just didn't have the time to be honest, but like you say, we, we have interests out with, and I think it's healthy to have interests out with as well. I mean, I, I couldn't sit and watch TVs all the time or sit and listen to things all the time. So, we had our first pony club run out at the weekend, we had to keep it down to six cars, I think seven turned up in total. But, um, just because things are still in lockdown and you're only allowed 30 people doing one thing, which would mean it would be. 15 cars, wouldn't it? Two, two per car. So we we kept it well below that. We had to run down to um, Whitby, which is always nice. I love Whitby. I think it's a, it's a fantastic little no, harbour town. Where Dracula arrives. Dracula but... arrives there, yeah, at the Abbey. Um, actually, Stuart's just put the photo up there. You can see the Abbey in the background there. The, yeah, that Carfax the Abbey, is it? That is a good dramatic sky, I have to say. Well done there. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was dramatic all day, but we missed the weather. So uh, when I was driving well, we, home... I was driving home. I went through some hell of a rain once I'd split up from everybody else. But uh, no, we we dodged the weather all day, so I had a cr cracking day out. Um, but yeah, that that is in the in the novel, Steve. That is the Abbey, and I I think Lucy is Lucy not based in Whitby as well in the novel, um, or her family is or something. I think that's where the crossover is. But yeah, lots of history there, and it's a fantastic place. The thing was, with it being lockdown as well, we could actually drive through the town. I mean, you try and do that on a normal Saturday during the summer. Um, it's one of these towns that just gets absolutely packed out, like Scarborough and places like that. Where, but it was a good little run out. So um, did did us all good, I think, just to socially distance and have a picnic. Um, but the thing was, the grass pollen and my eyes were red. 
in no time. Were you doing um, a Dominic Cummings on the way home? Was it an experimental drive through Durham blind? I, I didn't quite go <laughs> via Barnard Castle, although the original route was to go up to Alston in Cumbria and then come down to Barnard Castle and then back. But we didn't go that way because it, it looked really wet that way. So we went Whitby instead. But yeah. Um, and today I've I've just suffered all day. My eyes are so puffed up at the minute. Um, and I was looking at myself in the camera and it looks like my eyes were closed at one point. So my eyes aren't closed. I'm not falling asleep. It's just I'm so full of the hay fever at the minute. And we were talking about this before we came on. And obviously Steve's down in the south. So Steve's had all this already. I'm now suffering as uh, as it moves up the country as, uh, as, as we... Cause you have spring before we have spring, don't you? It's like a week or, it takes or a while 14 for days. The perm- the perm- six months things. before you, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we did yes- that. Yesterday, I, I, um, my heavy hasn't been bad, but yesterday I, I tried to put my contacts in because I've noticed that if you wear your glasses, your screen looks about 20% smaller. And I'm, I'm paying good money for a big screen, so I want to get the most <laughs> out of it. So, so I put my, if I'm watching a film where I really want to make the most of it, I put contacts in because then it looks bigger. And, uh, and uh, I couldn't keep the contact in my left eye. It was it was too painful. So yeah. I, it's still a bit of issues there. But um, yeah, yeah. Now, in some years, I, I can go the whole year and not have any issues as long as I take my uh, antihistamine in the morning. I, some some years, I don't have any. But this year, it just seems to be worse. It's been for a number of years. So anyway, um, so yeah, that does put. Um, raise issues when you're trying to review TVs and stuff, um, trying to keep your eyes open and watching screens and so on. But I've I mean, got I'm, a, not gonna, uh, I'm not going to judge you. I, I had that awkward phase for a couple of days where I was profoundly deaf, which yeah, made reviewing yeah. audio equipment more yeah. of a challenge than but you would expect. You get days, you get days like that. But um, <laughs> I, I'm having a look at the high sense at the minute. It's a U7Q LCD TV. Um, it's set up. The Panasonic HZ2000 has arrived. I haven't got it out of the box yet because I'm going to get this high sense and also the LG Nano. 90 done first and then spends some quality time with the the 2000 because it's Panasonic's uh, flagship TV and you know 2000 last year was good I'll be interested to see what improvements they've made this year um, with it um, certainly if the 1500 is anything to to go by and I've, I'm writing that review up at the moment and shoot, um, editing the video the uh, the gradation on them is absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, you don't need smooth gradation features or anything like that with the Panasonic's. I don't know what their engineers are doing, but there's no black flashing um, when you get just above black, which LG suffers from. And it's an LG panel that Panasonic are, are obviously buying in, but then they do all their stuff on, on the back end of that. Um, motion is well fantastic. Um, it still has that odd thing where if it's a... a, a a cloudy or a dusty scene or whatever, you can see a micro frame stutter now and again with 24 frames per second material, but only in scenes like that. The rest of the time, you never see it. It's never an issue. So, it's so dropping yeah, a frame, is it? It's not not even dropping a frame, Steve. It's just a really strange little micro stutter that it does. It's um, And like I say, you only really see it in clouds or if it's a really misty scene or something like that. Um, and and it, it's a little bit more obvious the rest of the time, I never, ever see it. Never, ever see it the rest of the time. So it's one of those strange little foibles that Panasonic have always had on their OLEDs. But this year, in terms of motion, in terms of uh, gradation and picture and, and so on, it's absolutely fantastic. It looks great. Um, they they know how to make a, a movie watching TV or a TV for movie watching. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the features that the LG does though for gaming and so on. So there is starting to become a definite split between manufacturers in terms of their OLED TVs. You know, the LG is the all-rounder, although they haven't got Freeview on this year um, at the moment, Freeview Play. Um, but they, they are a lot more towards the gaming side of things because they have uh, a lot of the HDMI 2.1 features on there. Whereas Panasonic, not so much. I mean, there's ALLM and EARC on the Panasonics, um, and they're still uh, HDMI uh, 2.0b ports on there the, as well. So. Like? Uh, on the Panasonic, it was 21.9, so 22 milliseconds. Um, Not bad, but when you got sort of LG and Samsung getting below 10 milliseconds, that's so. Um... Yeah, well, that yeah, well, the um, the C10 was 13 um, yeah. at 60 hertz and six at 120 hertz. So, so yeah, I mean, input like a bit 22 seconds. It's 16 frames on a 60p, so is is one frame. So, it's not it's not 
that bad. Um, they could be a little bit better. But like I say, there, there seems to be this definition now between manufacturers as to what their, their specialities are. And Panasonic are definitely going for Hollywood to the home, director's intent. Um, the filmmaker mode also uses the sensor um, this year as well. So, uh, yeah, fantastic TV. So like I say, the, the 2000, I will be spending some quality time with that. I'm going to... Um, uh, put some real time on that one because it's. I think it's going to be one of the TVs of the year. And I've I've already done the C10. The reviews up. Video should be up late tomorrow. Um, and we've changed the way we're doing the videos this year. So um, rather than sitting through design and what the remote control looks like and all the rest of it, we're just going to get stuck straight into measurements and all killer, no filler. And then at the end, we're going to do. The design and the remote control. So, if you're interested in the, you know, the the smart TV system and the design and all this, that'll be at the end of the videos or towards the end of the videos. But there's a great thing on YouTube now. If people haven't noticed it, is if you mouse over the video um, that you're watching, um, a lot of them now have have split into chapters, so you can actually chapter skip uh, videos now. If you haven't noticed that on YouTube, so we'll also have that on all of our videos, so you can jump backwards and forwards on that. Um, so, yeah, spending a lot of time with TVs, which I enjoy doing, but it's just, why do they release TVs in the summer? Especially for reviewers that live north like me, where it doesn't get dark till half past ten in the evening. <laughs> Blackout uh, blinds, it, Phil. Blackout blinds, that's all i got to say. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't really work, though, Steve, really, does it? Blackout blinds. I mean, you'd have to really black out the blinds, like, really cut out all the light. So I have to say, I've got fitted wooden shutters in this room, which is ironic because I don't review televisions, but when they are pulled shut and slat and, and fully fully down, the um, they are it's impressively dark in here. Although it being the summer, I haven't closed them in months. So um, and I apologise to my neighbours when I wander in, um, not wearing a lot. You know, <laughs> I live here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can't do that. There's a school outside. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't it be? It wouldn't it be advisable. That's yeah. one for the register. So uh, yeah, be careful. Yeah, wouldn't it be quite advisable doing that here? Right. Um, moving on. Samsung look like they're pulling out of yeah IFA 2020, which I'm not surprised about in the slightest bit, Steve. Um, it, it's going to have to be uh, an online show. They're, they're trying their best to get people there. I understand why they're trying to get limited numbers of people there. Um, they have to make a go of it. Um, they have to have their show. Um, but when you see the major, other major shows like the the car shows that normally happen during the year, where you know they spend even more money on stands and and presentation and all the rest, they're, they're on a hide into nothing. I think the organisers of IFA and even CES, which is you know if you look at what's happening in the states now and project that forwards, because we're we're now seven months into the year, we're now starting month seven. Um, we're more not than fifty percent through the year. Yeah, so it. I'm not surprised. Are you if they pull out? No, not at all. In fact, I, I would be amazed if they didn't pull out. Uh, and the same goes for most other manufacturers. I think TP Vision's already arranged a uh, a virtual press conference. Yeah, they have. For, yeah. For, and and I'm, I'll bet you ten bucks to a box of donuts that Samsung do exactly the same thing. Yeah. And LG and all the others. What, why would you waste? Why would you even bother? Why would you risk your staff? Risk waste money? Just do a virtual this year, particularly. Just do a virtual press conference uh, and send us out the press. To be honest, that suits me down to the ground. <laughs> yeah, but you're, go anyway. you're, yeah, but you're a born person. You don't like people. You're not going to go, are you? <laughs> yeah, uh, even, no, I've I been know... to EFA every year for the last six or seven years, I think. I do know um, that some of even some of our more agrarious um, industry colleagues are going... No. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. no, you're absolutely right. Steve and particularly me, we are not uh, benchmarks for activity in this <laughs> regard. But uh, nevertheless, people people who, I mean, because it's it, let's let's turn this into into the micro. It's one thing for me to uh, judge the risks of sitting in a pub beer garden, uh, but uh, there's just so many processes simply getting to IFA where you will not have that level of control. No, that just it no. just no, it just not a chance. I mean, if I could, fl you know, click my fingers and teleport to standing yeah, outside I can't the mess. Can't be asked with getting my temperature taken at the airport, my temperature taken when you get on the plane, your temperature taken when you have, you know, it's just, it's just not worth the grief. Yeah. And you know, and we, as we discussed on previous podcasts, there ain't going to be much to launch anyway. So why waste? Why bother? Just do a cheeky press conference on uh, virtually. Tell us what you got coming in the last yeah. half of the 
the year, which ain't going to much, I suspect. And then, um, you know, I, th I, oh, think I, don't know what, I don't know what they're going to do about, about CES, because again, I, as you I'm, say, Phil. I'm gutted about CES, because it, it would have been year 15 for me, 14 yeah. or 15. In a row, um, that was a nice little run that I had. It's not there. an online um, computer game, Phil. You don't lose all your weapons and experience. I, I know, I know, but go, so. but I, I, you know, unlike you guys, I actually like the show, and I, I I like the the venues, and and I like Vegas. You know, I like I don't like Vegas for you know the casinos and all the rest. Of them. That's not my interest. But I do like. Uh, I, I like the setting and I like the show and all. It's a long way to I'm go for a decent it. burger. I will say that. Um, <laughs> But it's interesting, if you wanted an alternate take, I can't tell you which manufacturer this is yet because the, the product isn't ready to go, but um, an audio manufacturer, um, they've got a, a, an important new product. We'll be looking at it as soon as I can get an example of it, as soon as it's ready to go. But they took the very, I think it's an, an utterly logical decision, uh, and it's one that you sort of think, mm, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. They haven't gone to Munich. They, obviously, Munich, the uh, the high-end organization that, that that organized that most exhibitors have got the vast majority of their money back um it's all been done very very professionally they have sunk their budget that wasn't spent in munich into just they have i believe tripled the number of re review samples basically any publication that asks for, for a review sample yeah, of it is going to get one there's just going to get they're going to get the coverage by having more stuff out in the field and i yeah. believe that pete someone yeah gordon wheeler has said it's it that is basically a, a select number of companies have gone right yeah route one which obviously suits me down to down to the ground I, but, absolutely i mean i think we're all quite comfortable now taking deliveries and so on of kit we've all got our own little working practices that that we put it so we we stay safe the career stays safe and and we get the kit for in for review and i think that's the best way to do it and yes use the internet to do your press conferences and so on um and there's platforms like the av phones podcast you know we're open to people coming on the podcast mm -hmm. and talking about what they've got to to launch and all the rest of it and we'll it's be doing even that even better if they drink so. I'm just <laughs> um, so yeah just a reminder we'll be doing that on the 21st of this month with Den and uh, going forward also don't forget um, to get your questions in um, also donations there the are two ways of doing that you can do it via uh, Patreon which is patreon.com forward slash AV forums or streamlabs.com forward slash AV forums um, and keep those questions coming in we're going to get around to answering them very soon but like I say we're starting a new month uh, July seven months in already i'm not gonna say oh isn't this year going quickly because i think like everybody on this podcast we just want this year over and done with <laughs> get 2020 in the bin um and we'll start again in 21 uh, but anyway hopefully <laughs> <laughs> hopefully um yeah uh right so new month new stuff to watch on sky uh, apple netflix and so on if you're sad and it's sunny outside and you're sitting watching stuff like kaz does um so kaz pick some of the best stuff I, in fact i'm going to pick the one that's really jumping out at me from the list and normally i i, I don't care about these things i just don't have the time to watch them but tom hanks greyhound i've seen the trailer for it now a couple of times yeah in terms of the production values it looks like they've spent some some money on this and, well, and it's it a proper theatrical watch. film yeah. that yes. apple bought yeah. because obviously it can't open in cinemas yeah yeah um but yeah i'm, I'm well up for that one i'm looking forward to that yeah absolutely it looks great so kaz give us some highlights well, uh, Andy's provided all the end of month lists or yeah, end of month lists for what's coming out the following month for Sky and Disney and Netflix and Amazon. Uh, I've just pulled a few top titles from them, but um, but you can check out the full lists on on the website, obviously. But uh, for Sky, we've got um, the third season of Get Shorty. I was pleasantly surprised about them doing a TV series. I mean, I was very cynical doing a TV series from following the Elmo Leonard book uh which was adapted with john travolta and actually and pulling sequel. it off be cool oh don't no no i'm not really sure whether uh, the rock's talking. awesome in that <laughs> other than that other than that steve was <laughs> no, that was the first time the i was film? aware of the rock i think apart from maybe scorpion king and, oh. and me too and i thought you know what he was really funny in it playing this gay bouncer it's, steve it's... lost his cherry yeah <laughs> okay. um he also got the plot against america season one which looks interesting alternate u.s history with uh it's set in the 40s, again i think yes I, i'm, I'm, I'm really for looking that. forward to this I've, yeah. I've heard good things about this and, and um it, it goes to, it talks about charles Lindbergh, who was a nasty yeah. piece of work uh, a real fascist yes yeah, um, so it seems timely and... 
making yeah, him president. Does seem very, very timely. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we got that. Uh, Condor. Well, season how, two. how many? How many series have we got now where, where you get alternate histories like that? Because it was the NASA one, wasn't there? Where, yeah, the NASA uh, yeah, one. That was a great which, series, which was it. great. And, you also had uh, that one on Amazon, which Man which in High Castle. Man in High Castle. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Yeah, it came to an end. Yeah, they're they're having fun with alternate history and. What could have happened? I do really like the way they went with the space race. That was a clever idea. And this seems very on the nose topical, you know, uh, having a fascist as president. Um, anyway, yes, moving on. Condor season two, which is uh, which is based on the book, which was made into the film. So the book Six Days of the Condor, which made made into the film Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford. And the what happened the other three days? <laughs> I think they obviously thought they couldn't fill it out on the running time. It was going to be a three-hour movie, so <laughs> they just skipped it down it a followed. bit. It's like 21 Bridges. I never got to the bottom of why it's called 21 Bridges, and it was originally 17 Bridges. 21 Bridges into 21 Manhattan. It's 21 Bridges out of Manhattan. Yeah, sure, but why did they originally call it 17 Bridges then? Did they did they forget? Maybe they miscounted. Right? <laughs> so they mi- uh, miscounted is, is this, is this a, the name of the film. Is this a trick question film. about road bridges, 17 road bridges and, three, and, and the remainder being rail? I have no, no idea. Could the fact that. that almost nothing in the movie has anything to do with bridges seems ironic that they went to so much effort. Well, because it's a shame, it's a shame it doesn't have Jeff Bridges in it. So, yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I still, still, yeah. Anyway, th- th- there's so sorry, back to Condor. Condor season two. Uh, haven't actually checked out the first season. I'm, I must buy catch up, but it's supposed to be quite good. That's on Sky. Uh, Greyhound, Apple, not much on Apple, but that's a pretty heavy hitter for them to play with. Um, have have uh, they stopped doing the free trials now, have they? Or can you still do your free seven days or whatever? Just buy I, a random adapter so and they'll, the, give you, they'll give you another <laughs> year's worth. Yeah, that's, at, that's the, at the start okay. of uh, lockdown, they made free, um, was it um, the C and For All Mankind? Which are two of the best things to watch on there? So you don't have to ha- have a you don't have to subscribe to them to get those. No, okay. So I so just imagine I'll, I'll have inevitably broken my iPad again by and 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 had to repair it through Apple Care and get another free <laughs> year by the time that my existing subscription runs out. So um, it should be fine. So. I mean, a, a lot of these streams, well, Apple and Disney in particular, are clearly going to save all of their everything they want to show people until the end of the first in inverted commas free year you know because people disney have finally years. had it frozen too oh uh, yes too too little uh, too late i mean Hamilton. they're gonna they're gonna have to really pull out some heavy hitters like black widow heavy hitters to get people on year two there I, I don't well, i don't think got... so i don't think so because i think you've got such a a lot of people signing up for the year-long deal yeah. to start with that they don't really need to start their promotions again for that's what uh, i mean yeah the end yeah, so, of that year so oh, Jan- january i think they'll, they'll start yes. up in their promotion yeah. stuff well, it again. depends how you look okay. at it it was the u.s launch was november wasn't it was that right yeah, it november was, yeah. last year yeah. so they'll they got the mandalorian season two coming october november which is obviously designed to get everyone in the states to reorder and renew their um, subscription rather mm. and then if that's delayed for the uk they do that off spit all. blood yeah. They better not do that. No, what they can do in, in, in March when everyone else's subscriptions <laughs> run out is, you know, that's when they'll do one of the um, one of the Marvel shows, won't they? Yeah, I think. Um, I think which one is it next? Which one is it first? Um, is it Falcon Wonder? and Snowman? Or? Falcon. Not Falcon. Falcon, it'll be Falcon. Falcon and, uh, and uh, Winter Soldier. Winter. Falcon and the Snowman's a film um, <laughs> with Sean Penn. Um, or uh, the One Division. Is One Division first one? Or no, I think it's Falcon and Snowman. Uh, Falcon. Right. <laughs> you got me. Yeah, because One Division is supposed to tie in with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, isn't it? So yeah. that would be prior to that release when That'd they get be out. 20, know, the whole, Their whole schedule's gone out of window at the moment, isn't it? Really. <laughs> Although um, the, a lot of the quarantine restrictions and stuff have been um, for sporting events and for entertainment. Um, TV production and film production yeah, and so on, lifted. that have been relaxed and lifted so um, so we should see, see things getting back up and running again quite soon there um, so we should have some well, new stuff soon for a while at least Netflix has got a few interesting <laughs> don't go things. there Steve <laughs> we're all thinking it but let's not go there <laughs> I saw the photographs of last night. We're going yes, to I know. Right, it's I, coming. I obviously 
you, as you might expect, there's an element of defensiveness here. Not that I was one of those people. <laughs> I need to be clear on this. But I look. The kicker is not large groups of people congregating outdoors. If that were the case, we'd be looking at some form of spike from the bank holiday uh, activities on Bournemouth Beach and so on and so forth. We'd also be looking at, uh, you know, I need to be blunt about this. There'd be more spin-offs. I still don't think there's from... enough times past yet, Ed, for Bournemouth. Yeah, I don't know. We're talking it's, 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 it's seven to ten day incubation. So we should start to see some of these things. Yeah, but you've and, got to get that through in a number. So you're actually looking at three weeks. Mm, I st- I look I still it, at people congregating outdoors is still not a significant issue. Uh, we have it's to how they get people. to the outdoors, which is the catch. That's the challenging. Bit. Obviously, this is Ed's opinion. This uh, this is not medical fact in any way. Um, he is Karen at the moment. Mm, well, look. All right, well, we'll see how it goes. But nevertheless, in terms of people standing around outside... No, I, I agree with you. Outside, it's not as bad. Um, uh, certainly, if you're in an enclosed space, that's a lot worse uh, in terms of... That's much more... I mean, what, if you, if you are belief. not wearing... I mean, I, it still staggers me. I mean, I habitually wear a mask to go shopping. Um, just a logical thing to do. I'm very much in a minority of people that do. Uh, I mean, that I, I'll be honest, very Ed, I've largely forgotten there was a virus going on. Because around here, it doesn't seem to be <laughs> like exactly I, I the same as it's, a... it's always been. <laughs> yeah, you still know, the sheep so... in the fields and horses. Yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few farmers, the old tractor. That's yeah. <laughs> is, is, there, is there still people walking on your path, though? Have you gotten the shotgun out to them oh, yet? Or... Get <laughs> off my <laughs> land. <laughs> yeah, no, shotgun it. There's a red sky at night, get off my <laughs> land. Um, red sky in the morning, get off my land. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Yeah, walkers and cyclists are still a pain in the ass, but otherwise it's fine. <laughs> Is that because they're harder to hit? Because they're <laughs> Yeah, a bit like uh, licensed taxi man saying the sheep are worried, though. So. <laughs> well, they should be. <laughs> <laughs> We've got footage to prove it. Somehow. I know, that's what I mean. Mm. I've got, got form in that particular area. <laughs> and we're not joking. Right, uh, Netflix, what's coming up, Kaz? Yeah, Charlize Theron's got a new uh, heavy hesser, um, kind of a superhero movie. She's immortal. I'll give it a look, but I bet it's bollocks. I know the trailer doesn't bode well, and the early reviews are a little bit interesting, so we'll see it's what that Netflix. is. Netflix, Netflix yeah. generally means it's crap. I well, mean, no, I mean, no. they, make, they make amazing documentaries. Their yeah. documentaries are absolutely some of the best yeah, I've ever seen. Absolutely. Um, a lot and of their the TV TV's shows are top bad. draw. They do some yeah. fantastic TV shows as well, particularly their own stuff. Yeah. Not so much the stuff they buy in, but the stuff they actually make themselves yeah. is often really it, good. But the movie. movies that they do are rubbish. And that's why, they, if they're on Netflix, it's usually a byword for it's bollocks. Yeah, there's... It <laughs> Even that be fire saga lovely. thing with Will, with Will Farrell has only got a ropey five out of five, ten from... Oh, Thomas. don't. I can't believe you mentioned that. Do you know how much furore that five caused? Yeah, there's many people. I'm oh, around no, watching you... it, but there's many people that do vehemently disagree with it. I believe with the part five. of the problem is that Tom is, is, is a hardcore Eurovision purist, and I can respect that. But it means that he, um, he, he, he was holding content about Eurovision to a higher standard. Than, <laughs> um, uh, I know that sounds ridiculous, but he was. Is, it's like um, pe- people were saying it deserves at least a six. At least a six. <laughs> it's just it it's was someone's a, opinion. They can it was, score it however they want. Yeah, and then it became that. It became why do we even have reviews? You know, why don't you tell us about <laughs> well, the picture quality okay. on Netflix? Yeah. Are you yeah. saying that if we leave it any longer? That was the Hamilton it, review. That <clears throat> yeah, it was, no, it yeah, happened it was on Hamilton. Tom's review as well. It was the same guy. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Bogart. Trolling. Yeah. Um, so Netflix is old guard. We have to look forward to. Um, Tom's actually reviewing that. So. <laughs> It'll, either way, it'll be entertaining. Um, Netflix's uh, Cursed Season 1, which looks interesting, actually. It's the origin of The Lady of the Lake, based on the comic book by Frank Miller. I think Netflix just appeared to buy up every story based on any comic book ever. Um, they are trying to corner the comic book market, yes. apart from, obviously, Disney, who own Marvel, and Warners, who own DC. Yeah, yeah, they want anything else is points. on Netflix. That no one's heard of based on yeah. the comic book but they're they're doing stateless season one uh well actually it's a mini series uh kate blanchett created it and she's co-starring in it um it's about immigration in problems in australia speaking of uh, kate blanchett she's also this week on bbc2 um mrs america about um 
about the uh, women's, lib lib women's liberation movement in the US, which is supposed to be really good. And she's okay. I never get around to checking out what's actually on BBC. Real TV. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. I did watch something good the other day. I may destroy you. Oh, no, that's getting was... rave reviews. I yeah, mean, if I turned was... my TV on, that would almost be certain that I'd probably watch. Yeah, that was phenomenal. I might if I, if I finish that up, oh, I might have to knock something up for that because it's it's that's very good. Anyway, for another day, the, we've also got uh, Transformers: War for Cybertron. It's an animated show. High production value. You're very really excited good. about this, aren't you? I am. I am. No, my son is very excited. I'm not excited at all. I'm completely impartial as to anything Transformers. Uh, I've we been forced to you. sign a document I by my wife to say that. <laughs> in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love it. We got a new load of Transformers in the weekend. It's. it's... <laughs> what do you mean? What do you um, mean? We? You got a new load of Transformers in the weekend? It's, it's for my son. Okay. Yeah, keep telling yourself that, Kaz. Uh, Netflix is also doing Umbrella Academy season two. So uh, I think a lot of people should be looking forward to that after the first one, because that was a good comic book adaptation. And to finish it off, Amazon, who don't appear to be releasing a great deal, they just did Hannah season two, which I actually really enjoyed. But they're, they're stars sub platform. So you have to subscribe to Amazon, then subscribe to stars uh, doing Doom Patrol season two. And I have to say, I absolutely love Doom Patrol. To the point where I, I might have to cover that in advance of season two because it's it's really very very good, kind of a, a blend of Umbrella Academy, Titans, uh, and Stranger Things. It's I, I absolutely loved it. Uh, rec I strongly recommend it. Tim Dalton as well. He's always worth time. Um, for people who uh, have the same divorced mindset as myself um just so you know now tv subscribers uh, uh for reasons wholly unexpectedly uh nat geo dumped four seasons of air crash investigation <laughs> on, um, and, and you've watched them already i've watched some already yes yeah. I, 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 uh, we've had this conversation we're not going to re 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 rehash it i don't consider it to be well some of the episodes are profoundly depressing i don't consider most of them to be depressing when viewed in a wider you not personally being on the plane sense, so that's that's fine. But it's just in case you know you 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 know you've, you you're like Kaz and you've blown your way through new content. It's all there, and also it air crash investigation is not the sort of thing where you go, oh, I'm really missing the extra lines of picture, which obviously now TV can suffer from. It, it to be honest, it it it's fine in its in its base version for air, air crash investigation. You're not going to lose sleep over it. So that's there if you want it. And there's still an awful lot. I mean, if you are like Phil and myself and you enjoy watching Americans shouting and breaking cars, they've 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 put a lot of that content up as well. The only thing that's really missing from Now TV that I would probably binge watch by you know just sticking myself to the sofa if they put street outlaws back up on there i'd watch all of that yeah but... i noticed there was a new one of those and uh, i've been watching the the new series of fast and loud as well which now that aaron's gone and he's been away for a while now i like how it's transformed that whole show now um it's a lot better i mean obviously he's still got to put up with richard rollins and and he can be a, a quite a diverse person but <laughs> Yeah, at the same time, a lot of the stuff that they're working on now is is a lot more diverse because you haven't got Arn Ray's beard and he doesn't like this and he doesn't like that and they'll only work on this and only work. they're they're working on a lot of old American classics. If you like your old cars and that kind of thing, it's well worth watching. Um, and the, and they don't just lower it and put big wheels on either. They actually they actually do. You must uh, have said yes. There's really some, some reasonably reasonably comprehensive yeah. work going on. So yeah, so there is there's there's good stuff to be had. So, yeah, yeah. I, I watched um, Freeman uh, John DeLorean on the Sky documentary, so it's on there now if you want to watch that. Oh. Um, it's uh, really well done because they've, they've kind of done it as a docu soap stroke documentary stroke actual people sitting down talking to camera and then um so for some of the scenes some of the scenes are acted out and so and it sounds like a strange approach but actually it works really well for how they're presenting uh, you know the whole delorean story it's not just about you know the car that was in back to the future it's actually about the whole of his career from being a, a gm and turning um, pontiac around with the gto um the guy was a genius when it came to engineering and yes. also marketing um and and he saw the market for 
yeah, you know, uh, the baby, baby boomers coming through and extra money to spend and all the rest of it. So I think a lot of people remember DeLoyan quite rightly for his own gull wing car that was in uh, Back to the Future, but there's a lot more to the man than just that, and it's really quite interesting. I mean, the wives, <laughs> they're interesting. Um, you know, his whole social life and all the rest of it, it's uh, yeah, it's an eye-opener. It's well worth sitting down and watching. And there's actually, the movie is actually on Sky Movies at the minute as well. So um, so you've got Frame and John DeLorean and then I can't, uh, Driven is the is the movie. So like everything in Hollywood, you, you don't get one, you get two versions like of... buses, aren't they? Yeah, you get two v- versions of the same story roughly. But yeah, you've got Driven and you've also got Frame and John DeLorean. So both worth watching, not just for you know, the Back to the Future car, but the the whole story is just, I mean, they say it in it, they say, if you gave this as a script to somebody in Hollywood, they say, no, that that's too unbelievable. But, you know, it actually happened. You know, the, the guy actually managed to start his own car company, which is amazing. Um, right. So that's everything that's coming up. I'll just make a big plug for a, for a podcast, of all things. Um, but I mentioned it on previous, uh, previously, called A Wind of Change. I believe there's going to be some bonus episodes on Spotify this week coming. So if you enjoyed that podcast, and I thought it was brilliant, probably my favourite podcast of the year. Um, it's a bit, just a recap. It's basically about this journalist who heard this story about this from the CIA, from someone who knows in the CIA that the CIA wrote the song "Wind of Change" to help bring down the Soviet Union. And he goes on this sort of long <laughs> journey down a rabbit hole to try and find out the truth. And it's fascinating. Uh, and brilliant and really enjoyable just going on the journey with them is just so much fun and uh yeah so there's more more episodes bonus episodes that i'm well up for that great news <laughs> yeah i must have missed you talking about this after gonna have a listen no, to it. no no seriously it's it's really good it's eight episodes um there's a whole thing about the moscow peace peace festival which was a, a real thing that was done in 89 uh, dot mcgee who's a manager of all the bands that are on the list so ozzy osbourne um uh, um um, who else was it? Ozzy Osbourne and uh, Motley Crue, people like that. And it was a the Moscow Peace Festival, anti-drugs festival. And they were all, apart from Motley Crue, who had just got out of rehab, off their nuts the whole time. And some <laughs> of the stuff from the actual festival, the recordings, interviews, people like Ozzy Osbourne, are absolute comedy gold. And this guy, Doc McGee, really interesting character. You know, When they go into his background, you're thinking, basically, as you go through the podcast, you're like, hmm, there's a lot of smoke here. <laughs> Something's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's worth it. it. It would make a brilliant film. Uh, it's so, so much fun, and the guy that does it, he's, he's just really engaging. And um, it's uh, there's one episode where basically he becomes convinced that maybe he's the victim of a CIA plot to, 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 of disinformation <laughs> because he starts getting so paranoid. <laughs> uh, it's 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 absolutely superb. I can't recommend it highly enough. Oh, <laughs> I'll have to go. go and have a listen. Uh, right, so let's. Uh dive into some questions if there are any questions um i, th- I think it's uh, a little bit slow at the minute so if you've got questions get them asked yeah. um in the chat window and we will uh, answer them uh, steve what can they do in the meantime right in the meantime please remember to subscribe to your youtube channel if you enjoy these live podcasts and hit that bell to get a notification when we publish each new video hitting the like button will also be very very important and if you appreciate our forums our editorial content and our videos please consider making a donation and we just launched a Patreon campaign as well. So fill your boots, boys. Uh, okay. right, I, in, in the, in, whilst we wait for AV questions, Nigel Henry asked a beer question, which is actually, they're, 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 this is worth repeating. <laughs> um, why does the beer out of my recently purchased beer fridge taste so much better than beer out of the household fridge? It's not for the reasons you expect. If you look at the beer fridge red, uh, um, uh, safety instructions. They say do not place food in the beer fridge, and there's a very good reason for that. They are not as cold as a normal fridge. They're not designed to be as cold as a normal fridge because beer is, with the you know, with a couple of exceptions of really grotty lagers, is not supposed to be as cold as 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 you know. This whole business of super chilling stuff. I mean, Guinness especially. Guinness should be cold. It shouldn't be less you know below the freezing point of water the reason why your beer fridge tastes better is because actually it's not chilled things down quite as much and there's more flavors going on and uh it's better as a result of it so there you go okay you asked Uh, i delivered phil saying question how far realistically are we away from mini led tvs do you mean micro led 
Phil, because yeah, I, mini, micro LED. I think you mean micro LED because mini LED is a thing at the minute. Uh, TVs are out there, especially from TCL. That's their uh, marketing thing at the minute. What, at least one or two of their models is mini LED. If you're on about micro LED, I think the whole COVID thing um, well, has, has delayed things um, in terms of um, uh, how quickly we're going to see these things come to market. Because what you're probably going to see this year um, and then the next year, and maybe even into late next year, is that a lot of products that are being launched now or or have been launched this year, they're going to carry over. Um, it's the only sensible business approach that, and unless they've got unlimited funds, um, it's the only sensible business approach to take at the minute is to release the stuff in, out there and then catch up in terms of other ways. Micro LED is going to be a different thing. It'll be on its own little trajectory. It'll be working on its own little team and so on. Um, I certainly don't have any other information other than that um, that it'll be getting worked on and it'll arrive when it arrives. We were supposed to get models this year. Um, and again, I don't know anything. Steve might know something, but I don't know anything at the minute. But I'd be very surprised if we do see anything this year in terms of micro LED. I think we we might get an, some sort of announcement around E for time because um, they were supposed to launch a whole range of micro LED yeah, TVs. Yeah, they were. Yeah. Maybe I, I I have a sneaky suspicion they might say announce a seventy five inch, but you know under current circumstances, uh, clearly all their plans are going to be delayed. So um, there might be some announcements. Um, but I, I I'm not expecting to see much in the way of actual no, product no. till next year at the earliest. And another thing I want to pick up for your question here, you maybe didn't mean it this way, um, but you say with OLED already at its peak, that, that kind of comes over as a negative. There's nothing wrong with OLED at its peak. OLED is a fantastic TV technology, and the only downside to it is when it comes to uh, in terms of peak brightness. But you've got to remember that OLED's big party piece is that it can do black on a pixel level. So when it comes to high dynamic range, you're getting more high dynamic range on an OLED than you are even on the brightest LED LCD TVs. The trick that the brightest LED LCD TVs pull out is the fact that it can do full color volume. Um, so you've got your little differences, but I would not say that OLED having reached a peak or its peak is necessarily a bad thing um, at all. Certainly with the TVs I'm getting through at the minute, um, I'd quite happily live with with all of them, to be honest with you, in terms of, uh, you know, picture quality and so on. Um, if you didn't mean that, then apologies. Uh, but I'm sure you'll we'll get a follow up on there. Anything that you've seen, Steve? I noticed there was some discussion about the SVS review that you put up. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say quickly, uh, hello to Gary, who's watching or listening and watching, hopefully, uh, in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. He's been stuck there since January. <laughs> There are worse places to be stuck. <laughs> I was going to say, I could think of worse places to be stuck. Uh, I had a really, really fantastic New Year's Eve in Phnom Penh back in 2000. That was a good night out. I went to a bar called The Heart of Darkness, and it was like the Wild West back then. There were blokes on mopeds giving you lists from which clash the on their back. Rats the size of dogs running around. It was brilliant. No street lights. Absolutely terrifying. Good night out there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I was just going to find that. Um, where is it? That was from your, your friend, Ken. He said, I liked your review of the SVS. Um, any cylinder subwoofer does it for me, as you know, from seeing my three. And then there was a discussion over cylindrical subwoofers. Uh, they are weird-looking things, and I need to be clear that if you own a cat, you might be in trouble. <laughs> um, I, hadn't, I hadn't have thought of that one, Ed, but I, I used to own one of these. I'm trying to remember what model it was now. I mean, we're going back to the very, very early days of AV forums uh, before yeah. we even had editorial. Um, it had been about 2002, maybe, 2003. Yeah. Um, I owned one of these. And I imported it from the States. There wasn't any UK dis distributor back then. And uh, it was one of the most disappointing products I'd ever had because um, I live in a flat and with wooden floors, which go straight to downstairs, so I don't have a concrete floor. These are obviously downward firing. Downward firing. Um, so, yeah, the opticians were probably getting a better, <laughs> downstairs was probably getting a better <laughs> performance than I was in my cinema room. And I, I even tried putting concrete blocks under it and so on. And, and obviously with the design uh, at the time, um, I wasn't getting the best out of it. And I eventually moved it on. I think I got two Servo 15s, um, I think I did uh, a swap with somebody. Approach. Yeah, yeah. I went route one, placed them on top of each other. Completely different performance altogether. But yeah, it's one of the things to keep bear in mind anyway. If you 
you live uh, in an upstairs flat or or you have a wooden floor, vaulted floor, um, probably not the best design to have a, a downward firing subwoofer um, because base waveforms are very long. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I'm not being. I, I I I need to be clear about this. My previous cat singular, I had an SVS cylindrical sub come in for review, and she left it well alone. The one that's just appeared on my lap, uh, I mean, bless him, he only ever uses scratching posts, but he looked at the large black cylindrical objects and went, "Yeah, that's a scratching post." So um, that was. Uh, I would like to thank the distributor for their patience and <laughs> understanding in how it, looked when it came back. Um, yeah, so, so if you're a cat woman like Ed, yeah, um, you stay away from cylindrical <laughs> some of us. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, just something to bear in mind. Home cinema. <laughs> well, I, do, I just they they have free reign of the house, Steve. The idea of keeping a cat out of a given room is just tiresome. Uh, um, yeah, well, my just, cat they, doesn't go in my home cinema ever. <laughs> Well, Jim is actually Jim has just arrived on my lap. Jim goes wherever he likes, in fairness, because he's a moron and he just, you know, he doesn't learn lessons like that. He just moves about <laughs> where he sees fit. So, you know. uh, right, another question. Hi, uh, Hypno Toad. Uh, my Panasonic plasma is due for replacement. I like the look of the LG, but I'm scared to leave the Panasonic brand. Um, it depends what you want the OLED for. If it's movie watching um, in a dark room and so on, Panasonic. Absolutely. Uh, if you want accuracy, uh, good motion, uh, great film performance and so on, you can't go wrong with a Panasonic. If you're more, like we said earlier on in the podcast, if you're more all-round performance and you like your gaming and so on, then the LG's not a bad shout. If you can get a C9, I'd go with a C9. Um, and if you can get hold of them, there's some good prices out there at the minute for 55 and 65 C9. Even, although I did notice, Steve, I don't know if you picked up on this, the 77-inch C9 is the same price as the C10 77-inch. Yeah, minute. I thought we talked about that last week, but it, yeah. it is. It's, it's retaining its value. I suspect that might well be because it's got a full complement of <laughs> UK catch-up TV services on it. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting... But yeah, I mean, if you're asking what I would do, I, I'm a big film fan. I don't play games, although I do because I've got to review the stuff here, but I die really quickly and, and I'm crap. Unless it's a driving game, but then that doesn't really t- tax the, uh, uh, the graphics engines and stuff. So... I, I'm not a gamer, so if you're like me and you enjoy your movies and TV series and that kind of thing, in a darkened room, uh, Panasonic every time for me. And the new Panasonics are, are really, really good to have made. They made improvements in, in important areas this year. So, yeah. Uh, anything you Following on from that, Nigel Henry, um, he's asking about whether to get C9 or a B9. Now, I know this is for your bedroom, Nigel, so I just say get the B9. Um, you got yourself a C9 for the lounge. B for B9. bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't exactly what I was going for, but yeah, it's a cracking TV. The, the differences are minimal. You won't really notice them. Um, uh, and so, yeah, save yourself a few quid and put a 55 inch in the bedroom. Or was it the kitchen? Maybe it's the kitchen. I think he, she, he, st- he stuck it's his not the, not the 65 inch um, Panasonic, um, which is the, uh, the big, the old nine, is it 905? Is it the, the, uh, the LCD that Panasonic did? They're sort of top of the range one. They're very good ones. Oh, it was a 920, wasn't it? It began with a nine. I know that. Yeah, it began with a nine. <laughs> I forgot the best of the model number. Um, he had that, and I think he moved it into, out of the lounge into the kitchen, and it was a bit big for that. Nine and or two. Only, only oh. Ken in, in Edinburgh can get away with having a massive TV in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I, I just I think I go for the B9 uh, under circumstances that you're you're referring to, Nigel. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the seven versus the nine chipset, it's not going to make a big difference in the OLED TV, so I wouldn't worry about that either. Uh, especially if it's like Steve says for the bedroom. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, nine oh two. Thank you, Phil. <laughs> uh, <Don't sing. laughs> That's it. And the uh, the other thing was uh, yeah, this Nano TV the, that I'm going to be reviewing has the seven chipset, so it'll be interesting to see how that works in that as well. So, um, yeah, keep an eye out for that review. Uh, any thoughts on companies releasing sets with 4K 120 input uh, but only having 60p pa- panels? Really bad if you connect a cut. Um, yeah, but I haven't seen any 60p panels do 120 yet um, no. that I've seen that have come through for review. The only 120 panel is the... Um, uh, LG models. So the C10 took a 120, a 1080 120 um, signal that I fed it with a Meridio, and it did it fine. Whereas the Panasonic that was sitting side by side with it um, would not take that. Um, and uh, and again, but it can do 120 um, BFI. So 
Yeah. Um, I think in terms of 120, you're going to see more movement in LED LCD, I would think, first of all, um, before it moves to uh, to OLED outright, because I think LG are the only company doing 120. I could be wrong on that, but that's my sneaky suspicion that this year only LG do um, 4K Samsung's 120. Samsung can accept uh, 4K 120. That's what I said. Apart from the LED LCDs, I think LG the only one doing it on OLED. Oh, sorry. So, just, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But yes, the, uh, the Samsungs will do it, yeah. Right, uh, I think that's all the questions um, at the minute, unless there's anything else. It's, well, there was a question okay. about uh, burning, uh, but it doesn't... Uh, sorry, hang on a second. I, I was momentarily off screen. Um, uh, Michael H, current Gen OLED's less prone to burn than the previous. My C7 yes. has... Uh, but, I mean, obviously, I'd say I've got a B7. Uh, now, i got to be honest with you, I don't watch a huge amount of YouTube. I, actually, I don't watch my television very much, but uh, I don't watch a huge amount of YouTube. Um, when my son wants to do extended sessions of watching Americans shouting at computer games, he's banished upstairs. Um, <laughs> It, uh, I mean, Mr. Botwright, though, has been gaming with some considerable, um, you know, uh, you know, he does it a lot on a B7. He's got the same as me. And he, uh, I mean, what, it, sorry, let's try that as a sentence. Are, are you running it hard? I mean, is it in, in, in bright settings or so on and so forth? Because it doesn't really, I've, I've never had, you know, retention, let alone burn in on any of the things that I've, I've done on, on mine. And I know, I know that Mark's been pushing, you know, red, red dead redemption two through at uh, 4k HDR and I, and, and other, other games he's got, which have got similar functionality. He pushes his relatively, you know, relatively uh, to its relative design limits and doesn't seem to have had that issue. So I, I don't know if the new ones are any better than, I mean, from the seventh generation yes, yeah. onwards, they seem to have been pretty robust anyway. Yeah, it's, 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 not nece- it's not necessarily the panel either, although the panels have got a lot better. Um, they have a lot better heat dissipation, which is a major thing uh, for causing retention. Obviously, the longer the TV's on, the, longer, the more you've got static images on there, um, you're causing heat, that's what causes... Yeah, image retention. You'll always get image retention before you get burn in. Um, the new TVs have better mitigation technologies on them. Um, the panels are more... It, I, one thing you'll notice is if you look at our reviews and you look at, at the peak brightness, you'll notice that LG have, have basically flatlined the peak brightness. There is no more peak brightness um, from OLEDs uh, for the last at least three years. Um, part of the reason for that is to mitigate against... Uh, possible retention but you also have uh, stuff in there you should always put your OLED into standby you should never switch your OLED off at the wall always put it into standby so it can do its compensation cycles Um, that's where uh, it fights against retention it will stop getting retention now they are um, prone to retention they are a self-emissive technology the same as what plasma was although plasma you didn't get a hell of a lot of retention before you got burn in. You, <laughs> once you got burn in, that was it. It was burnt in. It was there. Um, the less so in terms of retention. Although if you put test patterns up, like me and Steve do on a regular basis, you will see the retention of the test patterns. But they normally um, they go within a few minutes. Um, and certainly the way that Kalman now works is that it puts in a couple of blank frames anyway um, and gives it time to dissipate before it take, puts the pattern back up on the screen, takes more measurements. Um, so yeah. People are aware of this. As an end user, I think you've got to have been living under a rock not to have heard anybody mention um, image retention. So as long as you know that there is a potential, then all you need to do is, is make sure you follow the mitigation circumstances, keep it in standby so it does the washes, and don't put it in vivid mode and have static images up on screen or any, anything else. Um, these sets can get incredibly accurate, even in game modes. Um, you don't even need to put it in a game mode with a lot of them. You can actually um, put ALLM on or go into the menu and switch game mode on for that picture preset. Um, you certainly on this year's TVs, all of them do that and allow you to do that. So you can keep control over your image quality um, and static images and all the rest of it. And I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Steve. No, that, that's sensible advice, Phil. I mean, I've, I've had a B7 for three years. I like Ed and um, and Mark, we bought them at the same time. I think um, you turn yours on though as well. You know, the yeah, I, I use it quite a bit, and uh, and um, never had any problems there. I had C8 for a year and a half, no problems, and I'm currently using C9 and no problems. So, uh, yes, as Phil says, you know, 
as long as you're sensible um, and you like leave it in standby overnight, that kind of thing, because it does um, screen washing when it's in standby mode. Um, generally, you should be fine. You should be fine with the new generations. There's lots of mitigating technology built into them now to try and stop it from happening. And as long as you're sensible and don't do anything silly, um, then then I don't think you have a problem. And if you do get a little bit of image retention, as um, Phil said, it, it should just go away. My, my B7 gets a, a lot of use. Oh, yes. I, I've forgotten yes. that you have one. You've got one as well. <laughs> I mean, yes. if, if they do send telemetry back to LG, they must assume that yours yeah. is just in a train station somewhere <laughs> showing <laughs> station time. 22 hours a day of something. So, yeah, uh, yeah it's um, no, never had any problems. Absolutely perfect. Well, there you go. Yeah. So Ken is in Edinburgh again. He's, in, he's asked a question and we're ignoring it. Um, I can't see. Ken, I don't know what, what you do to YouTube, is. but it hates you. <laughs> it I, doesn't I, like you, Ken. It really doesn't like you at all. Um, my LCD wide angle question is not getting much love. So I'll say, right. I'm looking for your LCD question, Ken, and I can't find it, unfortunately. So we're going to move on to the next bit. Type it again. Oh, I, um, I can see it. Can oh, you? All right. Yeah. Q&A. Why do manufacturers of high-end LCD TVs try to do wide-angle technology? Surely nobody buys a high-end TV uh, as opposed to a mid-range or budget LCD TV and then watches it for more than 30 degrees. No, I just uh, I, I think, I think if you talk, yeah. you're talking about like a family in, on a sofa sat at a sensible viewing distance, there will be a wider than 30 degree angle. Can, and there'll so. be more than one sofa. Simple as that. Yes. I mean, they, they are designed for to be used in lounges where a uh, a significantly large. I mean, it's for just like me or you on our own in the house. Yeah, we're sat right in front of it. But I do think with a you know a, a four or five person family, that's not necessarily the case at all. Um, and and just because you you got you know you're buying it for a, t, a TV for the lounge and for the family to watch doesn't mean say you're not going to buy a high end TV. So yeah, they, yeah. they want to widen the viewing angles. Plus, also don't forget from the perspective of LCD manufacturers, and I'm thinking mainly about um, about Samsung here. They're competing directly against OLED, which is very wide viewing angles, and they need to be able to tick boxes and say we got wide viewing angles too, uh, and yeah. that's another reason for doing it. Yeah, I mean this uh, this high sense I have in it at the minute, the U7Q um, looks great when you're sat at the right height and looking directly on the screen. Um, where I'm sitting at the moment, I am under 30 degrees, and I couldn't I couldn't watch it from here because it, it um, you know the the contrast just gets blown out completely. Um, and that's a that's a budget TV, uh, the high sense. It's uh, six or seven hundred pounds for the fifty five inch. So yeah, um, the only thing I think when the first came out, Steve, the uh, certainly Sony's implementation of it, um, it did suffer a little bit in terms of um, halo suppression and blooming and so on, and yeah. um, and it had a few issues. But I've got to say the the recent technology that I've seen um, that has the wide viewing filters on there. Um, I think they've taken the feedback on board and um, it's certainly not as bad as it used to be in terms of adding other um, uh, issues into the image. So uh, I, I have to say that some of the higher end TVs, uh, LCD, LED TVs are really, really good if you're watching them from. And, like and Samsung's implementation is particularly good. Yeah. Samsung did them yeah. last year and this year. That, I mean, there was a time when if you walked into a room, you'd instantaneously know which one was the other, which one was the LCD, just by looking at it from an angle. It's not necessarily the case anymore with some of the higher end LCD TVs. The sounds in particular have been doing where they, you know, even at a wider viewing angle, they still look really good. Yeah. Uh, Paul said, I did get burning on my Panasonic Plasma, mostly from playing games. I'm no longer a gamer now. Yeah, it's probably a sensible, sensible solution. Stop gaming. <laughs> uh, I've been very careful with my Sony OLED now. Um, that's, that's all it is, just be aware that it could happen and just take mitigating so you know even just doing a wash cycle is uh is is enough for a lot of these uh modern tvs now um there is questions about aging and how the panel ages and how um and we've yet to see that really with these these newer panels how well they age but like uh, most of us have said on here uh, they've got b7s and so on which is three four year old now so um, no major issues turning up on those TVs yet. So again, it just depends on how you uh, how you use them, and just remember not to push it too hard. Right. So I think we need to move on to uh, the next part of the podcast, which is surprisingly for twenty past eight, 
we're on the final discussion. This has never happened. Yeah. It's, all, it's always been past half past when we've gotten on to uh, the final question. So before we do that, um, please, if you are uh, have enjoyed the show up to now or enjoying the show, uh, please hit that like button. It's really important that you hit the like button if you enjoy it because uh, that helps us with the search engines and so on, especially on YouTube. It helps uh, the podcast get found. It brings new people to AV forums and to our little community here, and it helps them out. So please hit that like button if you don't mind. Um, and make sure that we uh, we pop up on the searches. And like Steve said earlier on, um, the whole donation stuff is in the description box as well. So if you feel like doing that, then uh, please uh, look in the description box and get the uh, the links there. Uh, just I just saw something pop up there before we move on. When's this 65C10 review coming? It's here. It's on the homepage. Um, top layer. Uh, written review at the minute, video review will be uh, up tomorrow. And like I said, right at the start of the podcast, you maybe you weren't listening at that point, uh, Paul. Um, but yeah, we've changed the way the videos are going to be this year as well. So um, so rather than doing design and remotes and all the rest of it, it's going to go straight into the picture quality section of it. So look out for the video. It's coming tomorrow. Written review on the homepage. Right. So Ed's back as well because we needed Ed to do this bit because mm-hmm. um, he's a big Brad Pitt fan. So Ed... The best and worst Brad Pitt movies for you. Oh, no. Right. Okay. Well, I'd forgotten just how much bloody stuff he's done. Yeah. But I maintain there is a quote. It's not my quote. Um, Somebody not a while ago said, Brad Pitt is a character actor trapped in a leading man's body. Yeah, that's true. Um, And if you work to that principle, uh, he's at his best where he's not being conventionally, you know, handsome and 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 doing all the sort of leading manny sort of stuff so obviously uh we quoted at the start of it i he and edward norton together in fight club it's just such an extraordinary partnership it's it's magnificent i love almost every every single aspect of that film i mean it's 21 years old and it still deals with issues that we're still very much dealing with now in terms of it's a masterpiece being men in our place in the world it's also a commentary on cinema the film itself Mm -hmm. and it's just absolutely brilliant um and um Things like the thing that and I have to say, I watched it not that long ago because it obviously cropped up on Netflix uh, in 4K. Uh, I think you know, turns like he does in, in things like Fury and so on and yeah. so forth, where it's not about him smoldering, and, and often the people that he's playing, they're they are he, he manages to capture flaws, flawed characters quite, quite effectively. Yeah, because um, I was gonna, I was gonna mention 12 Monkeys. Which yes, I think he's yeah. absolutely astounding in that. He's really good. I think. So I, I things... think he <laughs> he actually steals the movie for me away from Pitt, uh, away from um, Willis. Yeah, Willis. Willis. Yeah. yeah. Um, so things like that, absolutely magnificent. Burn after reading is another. He's bloody marvelous in that. Um, and uh, yes, Moneyball, Adrian. Kelly, I I love Moneyball. I mean, I don't understand a single thing that's going on. Uh, I mean. <laughs> baseball like all american sports it appears to be needlessly complicated but you know it's all it, he, and all again, about money <laughs> thoroughly thoroughly compelling to watch worst uh for me is a tie between seven years in tibet and meet joe black both of which are i just hate and i've never seen cool world so i can't comment on that so <laughs> yeah. i yeah, cool world was... not real cool <laughs> uh he was in true romance I don't yeah. think I've seen it. That's great in True Romance. Yeah. Isn't he? <laughs> He's brilliant in it. Yeah. Steals that film too. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say I'd say when he uh, when he started, I, I'm not sure I could get what the fuss was about. And I thought that a lot of his performances, even in big movies like Seven, uh, I thought they were overshadowed by the person he was with. So, for example, Morgan Freeman in Seven, I thought acted him off the screen. And uh, Robert Redford in Spy Game acted him off the screen. And it seemed to be a Brad, uh, Brad Pitt shtick he'd do. So you could, inter- in, you could swap his character in Seven for his character in Spy Game. The, the way they got unnecessarily agitated and did the typical Brad Pitt mannerisms was, was all there. But he diversified a bit, certainly over the last 10 years. I really enjoyed him in Moneyball. I actually enjoyed him in Killing Them Softly. Um, and I thought that 
uh, once upon a time in Hollywood, he absolutely stole the show. Yes, actually, that's. Well, I was, was just going to mention that he's one of these actors that just absolutely, if he's in a supporting role, he will steal the movie, yeah. and he did that in Once yeah. Upon a Time in Hollywood, and he did it in Snatch. He did, oh, yes. Yeah. He did do it in Mickey O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Mickey yeah. O'Neill in Snatch. So he was absolutely brilliant. So there's something to be said for that because, uh, I mean, he's he's tremendous in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and it yeah. doesn't yeah. doesn't quite re- rely on him doing the conventional Brad Pitt thing. Which was perfect in Twelve Monkeys when he was absolutely neurotic. But um, but I mean, I, I've loved him in everything. Fight Fight Club is great. I've I've loved enjoying his performance for watching Brad Pitt there, even if I find it very um, very samey at least early on. Um, but it is interesting to see him diversify. I did enjoy him in Ad Astra. As as for worst films, uh, I have to say I thought they his version of uh, Achilles and Troy was not particularly good. I don't particularly. I don't. But I I think is the movie as well. It's not. Yes, just it's, it's hard yes. to, to pin that. It, it, he is not particularly it, or or rather noteworthily bad in a film no. which is otherwise just. I mean, my my the sole wonderful thing about Troy. This is not a bad print thing. It's uh, but Troy was the first time that a piece of software which is now used a lot in uh, modern cinema to simulate battlefield uh lots of soldiers it see renders lots of soldiers on the battlefield and it gives them uh each individually rendered soldier a range of choices and and actions so it doesn't just look like thousands of people doing the same thing uh troy was the first time it was used in its modern form and they essentially turned it up to make the soldiers act as intelligently as possible and they all ran away <laughs> 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 Which uh, I just think is magnificent. Um, that there's an AI <laughs> lesson for us all in that. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know. Ken, Hello. thanks very much for your £3 donation um, oh, for answering you. the wide-angled LCD question. You're more than welcome, Ken. Thank you very much for your donation. You are, without it is doubt, our most generous viewer. <laughs> yes. You, you are. And, uh, yeah, thank you once again for that. And thanks for the questions. Keep them coming in. Um, so we're looking through what um, our viewers well, are also gonna... saying about Brad Pitt. So, interview with the vampire hasn't been raised yet. I can't remember the last time I watched it. He was pretty good in that, but um, yeah, no, he, but he was the kind of his role. It wasn't that he was bad, but he was playing a moaning git. He yeah. was playing which, a moaning git. Cruz yes. comments on at the end of the film, but yeah. It, yeah, so it's not a showiest part. But I would say that, as a general rule, Brad Pitt, because as Ed said at the beginning of this conversation, is essentially a character actor in the body of a film star. Um, he doesn't generally, a bit like DiCaprio. And certain other actors, but, but those two in particular, I generally they don't do crap, and they just don't, and they don't just do it for the money. They tend to pick roles that they really want to do. And I'm not saying they're always successful, but as a general rule, I would struggle to think of a genuinely bad Brad Pitt movie. There are Brad Pitt movies that don't necessarily succeed. Troy being a good example, you know, I don't think anyone said that make a bad film. Orlando Bloom's the weak spot in that, in my <laughs> opinion. I think yeah. I, I think Brad and um, Eric Banner are both really good. Um, for me, his worst film, and I, I, this is going to go against uh, my wife, for example, loves it. Most women love it. Legends of the Fall is a crap movie, I think, with Anthony Hopkins hanging me up something chronically after he has a stroke in the film. Um, and Brad Pitt is in that film playing the pretty boy star. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why I don't think it necessarily works for me. But as a general rule, I would say, pick a Brad Pitt movie and I'll watch it. And the chances are I'll probably enjoy it. The, yeah. there is, I, I, I think I'm going to do one that's oh. contentious here because it's a, it's not a bad film. Uh, but again, I'm afraid he's acted off the screen. Um, I I don't particularly think his performance in Inglorious Bastards is particularly anything to get excited about. It's all that it that's very one dimensional. And um I mean when you I mean admittedly it's a problem when you've got Christoph Waltz banging yeah, well, he, he, he's he's still yeah, winning yeah, an old just, yeah, just yeah. yeah. So but I don't I, I if I you know, the idea of combining Brad Pitt and Tarantino is very compelling, but I don't necessarily believe that the result was that compelling. No. Yeah, I think you're you're right there. But he, he does come across as an actor who, I think, if you were a first time director or somebody who had a really good script and a really good part, and there wasn't millions of dollars to pay him, I think he's the type of actor that if it if it engaged if it him, him and it interested yeah. him, he would do it for you. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and that's that's how he comes across. And let's face it, he started 
from very humble beginnings where he was playing, like I say, in true romance and little odd roles like that. Yeah. Um, Going back before that, um, Dallas, I think he was in Dallas for a few episodes. Was he? Right, yeah. Uh, but he, I mean, again, again it, it, Delmer and Louise was the first thing I remember seeing him in, and he stole the film there too. Absolutely amazing in that movie. Um, he, I think he's a, I genuinely think Brad Pitt is a really good actor. He and, at uh, least had, I mean, uh, the irony is that despite being a beautiful man, and I say that as a comfortably heterosexual gentleman, he is a beautiful man. He yeah, does he have, he is undoubtedly going to be able to keep working for as long as he wants and is able to because it uh, he is quite comfortable doing roles where it's not dependent on him being yeah. a beautiful yeah. man yeah. yeah and i no, think no. that's you know this is important for both actors and actresses you know you need to have a plan b in these circumstances and he's forget, had he, one since the start he of his did career. benjamin button so you know if you can yeah. do oh, benjamin God. button <laughs> you can do anything yeah i hate uh, that one. So, yeah, thanks, Phil Singh, for the, your suggestion interview of Vampire. Paul also said, very good in money, Paul. Yeah, Paul. Uh, Adrian's Spy Game was a great re, great rewatchability. Has great rewatchability. Uh, Tony Scott. Um, who else? Daniel said he was amazing once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah, absolutely stole the film. Phil Singh says the same thing. Paul, yeah, you're saying the same thing there. Thanks for your comments, Paul. Um, Phil Singh wasn't a fan of Troy. Um, so was. I don't think anybody <laughs> was. <laughs> you know, you're not special there, mate. Sorry. I suspect yeah. Brad Pitt wasn't a fan of it. <laughs> uh, licensed taxi man says he's never had Brad Pitt in the back of his cab. Sorry about that. I hope, maybe, maybe, a, I hope that's not a euphemism for something. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, actually, Agent Cash just flagged up War Machine, which was on Netflix, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, he, he was funny in that. He was. Uh, again, though, it would have been better if he wasn't the main character. If there'd been someone else for him to to be to be doing his his thing against, he would it, and would have then been going, oh, he stole that in War Machine. But no, once he's the centre, once he's the leading man, it doesn't work quite as well. I'll so. give you an example of a film where he's the, technically the leading man. He's absolutely brilliant in it, um, but I think partly that's because although he's technically the leading man, the, the another character is, has more screen time in, and is really the main character of the film. And that's the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Oh, it's yes. a brilliant, brilliant film. I absolutely love it. Um, and he is brilliant in it. But luckily, the reason he can be brilliant in it without having to be the lead, even though he's technically the lead character, is because the other characters in the name of the film, which is Robert Ford. And that's Casey Affleck, who is amazing in it, too. Yeah. It's, that's, if you haven't seen that film, I highly recommend it. It's one of the best films I've seen in the last 15 years. Um, I mean, there is one weird thing, and I'm going to say this now and ruin Brad Pitt films. Uh, not ruin, but it's, it's something that once you've seen him do it, you can't unsee it. He eats on screen in every single film he's in, as far as I can work out. Does yeah. it a lot in the Oceans movies, quite it, deliberately. He's always snacking on something. So, now, so, so, the, partial so, 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 exception, the partial exception to that is Fight Club, but he's eating on the phone. <laughs> So he's still technically... Or, or is he, though? Or is that, that actually... Um... Well, <laughs> so, so spoilers this, here. <laughs> is is this the same level as the foot fetish from, uh, uh, you know, his, his friend and director, Tarantino's I, I don't know, but he eats on screen in everything he does. Honestly, <laughs> just watch. It's it, it, There's no There are no exceptions to this. You know, whether it's Eggs in Fury... Um, as say Moneyball, he randomly attacks a sandwich. It builds the sandwich adds nothing to the plot, but he has a bloody sandwich on screen. Yeah, Maybe and the it's thing the only is, time he eats. <laughs> I was just going to say, Kaz, because I don't know how he keeps that figure. Yeah, he must eat. must be only when he given he's, he's on well camera. into his fifties. He looked in spectacular yeah. shape. Yeah, yeah never forget. Body, he's <laughs> never forget. He's fractionally older than Nigel Farage. <laughs> <laughs> he's older than me, and he, he look at him and think, "Oh my god, I let myself go." <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, we, uh, we need to do the podcast competition. So if, if you've hung around this long, it better, <laughs> yeah. it better be a bloody good prize, Kaz. Okay, well, you can win a copy of 1917 on limited edition Blu-ray box set. So that's, Is that uh, the 4K? It's the Blu-ray. It's the Blu-ray. And it comes in a big uh, it comes branded in box set. Manifestation with... of World War One. No, that's it's not right. Hang on. Big, big branded box set with a compass and a notepad, 
Um, and to enter this competition, you've got to use the following question to pick the correct answer. In what year did the First World War end? Ooh, hard one. <laughs> no, well, now, hang on a second. Can we be clear? This is not a smart ass thing. No, I know, no, no, it isn't. I know but, that it ended. Yeah, in a completely... Technically, it didn't end when you think it ends. <laughs> it, and also, yeah, it's not about when it ended in Andorra <laughs> oh, God. and things like that. It's like the right. podcast. Well, it, never it, looks like a, ends. it looks like a random person is going to get the, the prize then based on whatever <laughs> answer we feel like. Okay. <laughs> Right, okay. Competition is open to AV Forms members who are resident in the UK. Links to the competition is in the description. The competition closes Thursday. Good luck. Okay, well, thanks for your comments tonight, people who have been watching. And um, yeah, thank you again for your donation, Ken. It is appreciated. And that's it for the podcast this week. My thanks to Steve Withers. Sticking feathers up your butt does not make you a chicken. Ed Selly. A well, long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero. And Kaz Harlow. When you have insomnia, you're never really asleep and you're never really awake. If you enjoyed the podcast, then please like and subscribe to and hit the notification bell on our YouTube channel so you don't miss the next time we publish a live stream or a video review. And there's video reviews coming. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook and bookmark your forums. Yeah, for the uh, the latest reviews, news, and videos. Plus, you can leave us a five star rating on iTunes, uh, but you can only do that if you enjoyed the show. So if you have enjoyed the show, go leave us five stars. My name is Phil Hinton. It says it on the screen. That's I'm Phil Hinton. <laughs> I'm Phil. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>